Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another CPC Strategy hosted webinar. Today is day three of the 2018 Amazon Virtual Summit. For those that have joined us in the past two days or are joining us just for our third day, regardless, you will receive all three recordings to have at your disposal. But very excited today about today's presentation with Ecom Engine day three, talking about the secrets to a lean supply chain on Amazon. I know we alluded to it last yes on yesterday's presentation about setting goals and how a lot of goals can be aligned and a lot of goals can be achieved through having a very lean supply chain. So really excited to kind of follow up on that, but also have that conversation of why it's important and something that maybe not a lot of Amazon sellers necessarily think about. Before we do get into the content of the presentation, though, did want to go over some logistics today, just questions that we receive often or to resolve any issues that you may have. So first off, the session recordings and slides will be sent out within 72 hours. We do try to have it out to you as soon as possible, and you will have all three days worth of presentations and slides, again, at your disposal, just to review any of the content that maybe you missed or just to refresh your memory on content that you have tuned into us with. Secondly, did want to let you know that we have handouts in the right-hand corner slide, whether it's about Amazon sponsored products or just about how to succeed on Amazon, the ultimate guide to Amazon SEO, just resources for you to be able to use, to have to your advantage, to be able to kill uh, all your goals on Amazon for 2018. The very last thing that we did want to go in today's logistics is to submit all your questions to our panelists. We have two experts in the field. We have Ken and Jay uh, hanging in on Ecom Engine, Ecom Engine over there, uh, really experts in, in all things Amazon. So if you do have any questions uh, about anything that they're talking about, you know, the lean, um, supply chain, any concepts that they'll be going over, feel free to shoot them over my way using the question chat box functionality. It not only helps us really see where we can help uh, each of the audience members out, but more importantly, it ensures that you get what you came here for and getting your questions answered that you might have for our presenters. So again, any questions that you have, feel free to shoot them over my way. I will be in the back end vetting through the questions and of course, just making sure helping out with any technical issues or anything of that sort. My name is Anson Han. I'm the digital marketing analyst over here at CPC Strategy, and I will be answering and communicating with you all on the back end. Again, trying to just make this as smooth as possible. The one thing that I did want to say before moving forward is that we don't take your hour here very lightly. We know that it is very valuable. So throughout this time, we have these different resources for you. And again, the question chat box functionality for you, again, just to make sure that you are getting the most out of the time that you spend here. Did want to go into the summit details. Like I said, today is day three of our event. Day one, we had CPC presenting on the growing necessity, ran on Amazon, uh, shifted it over a little bit to talk more about sponsored products and the need to win on sponsored products. And then day two, we talked with Feedvisor about how to set your goals in 2018 on Amazon. Again, and a lot of goals can be encompassed or umbrellaed under uh, lean Amazon supply chain and making sure that your Amazon supply chain is as efficient as possible so that your business can grow and scale up properly, which is what we'll be talking about today. So day three with Ecom Engine, the secrets to an, a lean Amazon supply chain. Again, as I stated, very excited uh, for our speakers to present here today. Before we do go any further though, did want to mention CPC strategy a little bit, uh, who we are just so you know, you know that we are very knowledgeable in this space as well. We were founded in 2007. We have over 400 active retail clients and we do have solutions spanning the Google shopping side of the world, whether it's retail focused PPC and shopping, but mainly what we're talking about today, Amazon sales acceleration, content optimization, creative services, as well as Facebook performance marketing. So you can see below the, the diverse portfolio of clients that we have uh, under our belt that we have delivered lasting results for and who we are really proud to work with and who we are really proud to represent as well. So now that I've mentioned CPC strategy a little bit, did want to turn it over to today's speakers. We have both Ken and Jay from Ecom Engine, and I'll actually go ahead and let them introduce themselves and take it away with the rest of the presentation. So thanks a lot, Anson. We're really excited uh, to be here today to share uh, some, some thoughts and, and tips about a lean supply chain on Amazon. I'm Jay Lagarde. I'm the founder and CEO of Ecom Engine, and this is Ken Furlong, our uh, director of product and, and a longtime student of Lean and really an expert in software and Lean supply chain. So again, we're really excited to, to be here today and uh, look forward to sharing some of the things we've learned over the last really five to 10 years working with Amazon sellers. So just to introduce you a little bit about Ecom Engine, we, we started in 2006 uh, 
really doing uh, primarily uh, custom consulting uh, about uh, Amazon supply chains. Uh, so we did a lot of custom integrations. Um, today, in 2018, we are a software as a service company. And what you see here are the three main tools that we offer today, which is um, Restock Pro, which is our supply chain tool, Feedback 5, which is a reputation management tool, and Ecom Spy, which is a marketplace intelligence tool. So um, we do have a lot of background working with Amazon sellers, um, really tens of thousands of Amazon sellers. And we're hoping to share with you um, some, some subtle, but we think very critical things today that, that your, our listeners today can take home and, and hopefully help, really help to grow their business. So, you know, today's agenda, again, some of the things we're talking about today are not necessarily things that might be top of mind when you first start thinking about your Amazon business and how to grow your Amazon business. And that's really why we picked today's topic. We wanted to find something where it's not something that's perfectly obvious, but something that would really deliver a lot of hidden value. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly overview some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. Number one, the crit criticality of lead times for profitability. Um, number two, we're gonna look at some tactics for driving down lead times using different um, FBA uh, supply chain models. Um, then we're going to talk about really a hidden danger. Sometimes you think you're, you're really optimizing something really well. You're doing one little part of the puzzle and you're doing it really well. But sometimes by doing focusing on one thing and not looking at the whole, you can actually be causing more damage than, than, than good. And we're going to give you some, some ideas about why that's the case and give you some examples. We're going to look at, look at some pros and cons of different supply chain models for Amazon FBA. And last and very importantly, you know, an underlying theme of, of, of our talk today is really about Agile and Lean and FBA. If you think about um, retail marketplaces today, there's really no marketplace in the world uh, than, than Amazon third-party marketplaces, which are more dynamic, more changing, more exciting, uh, growing more. And it's more critical than ever today to be very agile, to be able to flex and deal with the changing dynamic environment. And we're going to give you some tips on how to do that effectively and grow profitability in your business. So with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to, to Ken Furlong, who's going to talk a little bit about why lead times are so important uh, for your Amazon FBA business. All right. Thank you very much, Jay. And good morning or good afternoon to everyone, as the case may be. So as Jay mentioned, we're going to start with uh, kind of a high level, just conceptual discussion of why lead times are so critical. And then we'll, we'll segue into some really specific uh, concrete tactics you can take home with you and start implementing today. So the first thing we want to talk about with lead times is, you know, if you have very long lead times, and by very long, I mean, let's say 60 or 90 days, the, that means you can really capitalize far less on near term demand that you may encounter, right? So perhaps you see an opportunity in the market, perhaps uh, you, know, you see an item for whatever reason gets very fashionable very quickly, uh, or for whatever reason demand kind of spikes. If you have very long lead times, you are sort of walking a tightrope uh, between two problems. One is lost revenue. You, know, you might say, well, this is a short-term blip, this is a fad, you know, it might be over by the time my uh, supply arrives, I don't want to risk it. Right? And so you might be leaving a lot of revenue on the table by not trying to seize that opportunity. Uh, on the other hand, you could err the other way and go ahead and you know, maybe uh, place a big order with your supplier or what have you, um, thinking that the demand will still be there when the uh, supply arrives. And lo and behold, the demand dries up. Right? And now you have lost capital. Right? You've got a lot of inventory, low demand. You're going to have to discount, liquidate in some way. Um, and you know, as a seller, you don't want to have to choose between those two risks, right? And the longer your lead times are, the more you're going to have to choose between those two risks. So that's the first thing about long lead times. Um, the second thing we like to talk about with long lead times is pretty much by definition, the longer your lead times, the further into the future you need to forecast demand, right? If, if it's going to be 60 or 90 days before you get new supply, you need to forecast 60 or 90 days out into the future, actually quite a bit more than that. And you know, pretty much by definition, the further into the future your forecast goes, the less reliable it's going to be. It's just like the weather report. You know, you might trust the weatherman when they say something's going to happen tomorrow. You probably don't trust them too much when they say something's going to happen 14 days from now, right? 
And it, it's just like that with uh, your demand forecast. The further into the future it goes, the less reliable it goes or it gets. And um, therefore, again, the more either capital or revenue you're risking. And then the third thing we like to talk about is, you know, the longer your lead times, the more inventory you're going to have in your supply chain at any given time, right? So if your lead times are, let's just say 90 days, you know, and you're 45 days into an order, you know, you placed an order 45 days ago, it's on its way, that sort of thing. You've got a lot of inventory somewhere. It's either in transit or at your local warehouse, maybe it's at uh, an Amazon facility, maybe it's on its way to an Amazon facility, but somewhere in your supply chain is a lot of inventory. And that's a real problem because most of the time that inventory costs you something, right? You've already paid for it or you've already paid for the transit or you're paying for storage fees at Amazon, whatever it happens to be, wherever that inventory lives in your supply chain, it's tying up capital and that's a problem. So at a high level, those are the first three things we usually talk about um, in terms of the criticality of lead times. And then as we said, we wanna pair this with some really uh, practical concrete tips for you to take home and start implementing. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jay and he's gonna talk about some ways to drive down your lead times. Thanks, Ken. And I would just add that Having excess inventory is also a risk, as anybody that sells on FBA knows. Prices change, demand changes, and you want to reduce that risk. Um, so, you know, the first thing we want to look at is when you're moving inventory from your warehouse to Amazon. Very, very common scenario for almost all FBA sellers. And what we're trying to do is just give you some tips that you can take away. Uh, some of you are going to be familiar with, with some of these, um, but hopefully we'll give you something of value that you can think about to, to get those, those lead times down because they are really more critical than you may first think. So the first is to automate the shipment setup. So setting up complex shipments, if it's you know hundreds of SKUs or even 50 or 60 SKUs, it's, if you're doing it manually, it, it's tedious. Um, and so we recommend automating as much as possible using flat files, um, using a tool to automate that shipment setup. That does a number of things that speeds it up and importantly, it, avoids, it helps you avoid error. Um, rigorously following prep rules. Uh, we all know this, Amazon has got very rigorous prep rules and, and it, it can be very easy to, to mess those up or, or sometimes ignore some of them. Um, but we know that following those prep rules, um, whereas it may take a little bit longer on your side, it actually increases uh, the speed of receiving at Amazon and reduces the likelihood of number one, receiving slowdowns, and number two, uh, the likelihood that you'll have errors um, in the receiving. Um, won't guarantee uh, no errors, but it will reduce the likelihood. Thirdly, synchronize inbound and outbound operations. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, we, when you set up when we set when you set up your purchase order with your supplier, have in mind what you're going to be sending to Amazon and how you're going to be sending it to Amazon. Consider having that FBA inbound shipment already set up, knowing how it needs to be parsed out, and if you can synchronize the way your PO is structured with your supplier to minimize the amount of processing you need to do, minimize the amount of errors that you may potentially have in your warehouse, uh, you, can, you can cut time, you can cut errors. And the same thing would be true when you think about staffing for that operation. If you're a very large warehouse and you've got you know, an inbound receiving staff and you've got outbound staff, well, you ought to think about maybe, maybe blending that, either having one person work on both or having a team together work on both that inbound and outbound because the person who processes the inbound, if they're also pushing the outbound, that's a chance for, for time efficiency as well as, as quality assurance and reducing errors in, in flipping inventory back out to, out to Amazon. Um, next, it should go without saying that Amazon partner carriers, they not only save you money, but oftentimes they can grease the skids in getting things um, into Amazon uh, more error free. It's not a guarantee, but but it does help. And then last, this is a, a little bit of a of a edge case, but there are times at Amazon where um, where things are very busy at the Amazon warehouse. It can vary a little bit from warehouse to warehouse, but we all know that you know December <laughs> um, Prime Day are times when things can get can get blocked up. And it sometimes is important to think very critically about that. If it's December 1 and you're trying to get inventory slotted in for sale at Amazon, you know, something, you know, demand jolted, you're trying to move things in to, you know, get those last 
minute sales uh, for, for in 4Q. You know, you need to think very critically. What warehouses is this going to? How long is it taking LTL or, or FCL uh, carriers to get to get uh, delivery appointments in Amazon? And if they are long, as they often are, think about spending a little more money and sending those packages in by parcel, because a lot of times that can greatly influence um, the speed with which your inventory gets into Amazon. So yeah, definitely. Sorry, Jay. Before I move on, um, really like those points and points of information. I actually didn't know uh, a few of them myself, and so I know we're getting a few uh, comments of, of of people saying that these are really good um, things that they didn't really think about. So that's awesome. We did have a question from Maria though, uh, and wanted to get your opinion on it. So obviously, we're talking in this case of of strictly FBA. Uh, she was wondering though, is there ever a point that you that you would think of where you would want to switch to FBM? Uh, to have some more of that control and maybe lower the cost of the fees as well or just as a whole fba just kind of makes things a little bit easier and again kind of does lead to a more leaner supply chain that you would recommend going against uh or, or you would go against going to fbm yeah that's a that's a really an, an excellent question the whole fba fbm uh equation and of course now we have seller fulfilled prime which is another layer on top of that where you can use amazon amazon carriers or amazon itself to pick things up from your warehouse and deliver them to your customer, and really, you know, this is a this, this is an equate this is a a puzzle that's unique for every given set of SKUs and every every given every given seller. Um, you know, the size of the SKU, the the cost of moving them around, um, as well as obviously some strategic things. Selling FBA does have some buy box um, benefits um, that that are that are helpful. Um, don't want to get into a lot of the details on that because there's some interesting conversations around FBA versus seller fulfilled prime versus FBM, um, but that's something to keep in mind. So without getting too far afield, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, we are available. The, we deal with these questions all the time uh, in our in our business, and we're happy to, you know, talk to one of our success experts or, or call, you know, contact, reach out to Ken or I. We can both really deep dive and, and help you think through some of the dynamics. And sometimes the answer isn't either or. Sometimes the answer is both. So, yeah, um, uh, another one of those great, uh, it depends answers. So that's great to hear. And yeah. before we actually do move on, we have another question from Robert, who is just asking if you could elaborate a little more on the differences between um, parcel versus LTL versus F FCL. Yeah, parcel is, you know, your standard UPS, FedEx type parcel, small boxes. Uh, LTL is when you're sending a pallet um, uh, and, um, you know, or, or, or several pallets, uh, uh, and, and FCL is when you've got a full container load. Um, so you're basically moving a full container into Amazon, and, and, and you own that truck. You don't necessarily own the truck, but everything in that truck is yours. Um, so um, those are the three different options, and, and there are uh, Amazon partner partnership opportunities to, to use their partnered carriers for, for all three of those inbound, inbound options. Yeah, definitely. All right, Robert, hopefully that answered your question. Thanks, Jay. Sure. So, okay. So now we're going to talk about, you know, another, another scenario where you're getting things from supplier to you, because again, this is all part of your supply chain. We're going to talk about some, some things that, that, you know, uh, again, subtle, maybe not always obvious, but they can really make a difference. Um, so one is to speak your supplier's word language. You know, if your supplier uses a certain SKU that's different from yours, if they like a certain format, if they like to get a flat file, if they like to get an email, Think about accommodating their needs, because the more you can do to speed up things from your in your supplier's world, um, and think like your supplier does, the faster they're going to move, and the less likely you're going to have misunderstandings or errors. Um, but part of that is if you can, if your supplier offers the ability to do to do EDI or some type of a bot file or XML integration, think about automating those orders, especially for a high volume supplier that you're working with, where you're kicking them orders regularly. Again, you've got speed, you've got, and you've got error reduction. It can be really crucial, not just on your end, but also from your supplier's point of view. If you're giving them the orders in which they like them, it makes it easier for them, and they, they will work harder and faster for you because of that. Um, communicate your forecast. That's interesting. This doesn't mean that you need to hand over your forecasting software over to your supplier, but it does mean to communicate with your supplier and let them know what your expected demand is. It doesn't have to be exact, but letting them know ahead of time lets them prepare for your needs. Um, and sometimes you have, can have a situation where a supplier can put, you know, soft holds on items for you um, so that, you know, 
if, if your rep is expecting you to order a thousand or a hundred of, of X, certain SKUs, maybe they'll put a soft hold in. If somebody else is trying to get them, uh, maybe you'll get a call. Hey, if, I, if you don't get these now, you're going to lose them. That, that type of communication can be really critical to having a really smooth uh, supply chain. Small and more frequent orders. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but one simple reason is, is that small orders are faster to process and, and, and less friction, less chance of error. Um, and, you know, Ken's going to go into a little more about why small order, small order sizing can often be more efficient from a lean perspective than big orders. Not saying never to do big orders, but think twice before you save a couple of dimes just to order to big order because they're big risks and there there's some some less agility by doing big orders. Pay on time. This is <laughs> uh, kind of a <laughs> little different one, but basically this is a way of saying you know be friends with your supplier. If you're always working them over and and you're not thinking of them as a partner, um, then they're going to think of you as less a partner. And you really want your supplier to be on your team, on your side, to work with you to help you be success. It can make really all the difference in the world. Um, so really, we think you should build a supply chain partnership. Yeah, definitely. And okay. funnily enough, you actually answered a question that we got towards the beginning of the webinar in terms of improving communication with your manufacturer. Uh, again, like you said, your supplier, just making sure that it is more of a partnership. So that's great to hear. Uh, John Drill, hopefully that question was answered for you. Cool. Okay, go to the next. So last, we're going to talk about sending things from your suppliers directly into Amazon. And, you know, this is really a great idea if you can do it, because think about it, you're saving a whole hop in the process. And if you can do it, you're saving uh, time and money. And time and money is, is the name of the game when optimizing your FBA lean supply chain. So the first thing is you want to train, um, you really want to train your suppliers. You want to give them everything they need to know in order to meet Amazon's prep rules. Um, you need to maybe even overtrain them you know, in the right way. Your your supplier may or may not know the way things look like on Amazon side. They may not realize that if they mess up box contents and things, you they will get you penalized and maybe even worse, uh, your your Amazon will be sitting uh, in limbo for, for too long before it actually gets received properly or there will be errors and so forth. So train them. Um, provide them with all the box labels, the shipping labels, et cetera, to make sure that they uh, get things into Amazon just as effectively as, as you would. There is a new thing being tested by Amazon that, that some people may be aware of called Supply Chain Connect. Um, this may not be for everybody, um, but for those that are willing to be uh, very transparent with Amazon and feel like it's okay to be very transparent with Amazon uh, about their supply chain, you can actually, um, there, there's a new, uh, a, a new tool in place where you can actually give your supplier access to something similar to your seller central portal where they can download uh, all of the information to, to, to get the, the inbound shipment correct um, and um, and do all the sorts of interactions that a seller would normally do uh, with respect to a shipment, including printing shipping labels and, and so forth. Um, and last, this is another little thing to think about. If you're thinking about supplier going directly from supplier to Amazon, but you say, you know, but I've got a few SKUs that need to be stickered, and I need to sticker those SKUs. Amazon requires it in my warehouse. Well, if it's just a few SKUs, you ought to think about paying, in that case, for Amazon. If it's just a few SKUs, it may be cheaper to pay for Amazon to, uh, to sticker those SKUs for you if your supplier can't, um, rather than, um, rather than uh, endure all the cost of bringing those items into your own warehouse. So, so that's a, a summary of our tips. There's obviously a lot more, but we think these are some small, subtle things that can, you know, incrementally really drive some efficiencies in your in your Amazon supply chain and can really make a big difference. Okay, Ken. All right. So thank you, Jay. Um, so we're we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the things Jay touched on just a moment ago regarding knowing your real costs and how sometimes optimizing one little part of your business or one little part of your supply chain can actually do harm to the whole, all right? And so in Lean, this is generally what we call local optimization. Uh, you'll hear that term a lot. Um, but, you know, let's think about it this way. You know, think about your real costs, right? Not, not just the costs that are easily quantifiable, but all the costs you incur when you purchase inventory, right? So first off, there's generally this broad category of holding costs. 
And there's just a lot of different flavors of this. First of all, and most obviously, there's the physical space that is going to be taken up with the inventory that you order, right? There's going to be storage solutions, whether that's racks or bins or, or what have you. There's all of the time you're going to put into it, right? Because if you have you know, a non-trivial warehouse with a non-trivial number of SKUs in it, you're going to have to do a lot of unit tracking. You're going to have to do a lot of sorting. Inevitably, you're going to have to do a lot of resorting as you try to move things around and, and fit things in as new opportunities arise. Um, if you're, even if you're storing things at Amazon, you know, you're going to incur some storage fees with some kinds of SKUs, uh, depending on what kind of business you're in. There's perishability, obviously. Um, and then there are all those things that, you know, we generally think of as overhead, right? So there's the insurance, there's the utilities, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, these, these are very real costs that you incur as a business, either physical costs, time costs, or just quote unquote overhead costs that you can actually quantify easily. But the point is, they're all costing you money in one form or another, but they're hard to attribute. You know, it, it's hard to attribute utility costs, for example, down to a particular SKU, right? And so you probably just don't bother. You probably lump that into a category called overhead and, and move along. Well, the problem with that is that it really is a real cost and it really, you know, is increasing as you increase your inventory, but you might not be taking that into account when you decide what to pay for something and what to charge for something. Um, so that, that, you know, really think about all those hidden costs that are just hard to quantify, that really need to be quantified and attributed. Uh, the second general category of costs would be opportunity costs, right? And again, this, this obtains for whether we're talking about the money, the time, the physical space, you know, whenever you're doing something with your inventory, you are not doing something with some other piece of inventory that you could be. OK, so if you're storing 100 widgets, you know, you're taking up space and now you can't store 100 cogs, you know, or if you have money tied up in one SKU, by definition, you can't buy the other SKU. Or if your personnel are spending time, you know, resorting your warehouse because it's getting cluttered again, you know, they're not spending time doing something else. So really think through those opportunity costs. And then, as Jay mentioned a little while ago, there's always demand risk, right? There's the risk that you have a lot of inventory. It might even be moving very well right now, uh, but that demand can dry up for a whole variety of reasons. And then, of course, there are lots of other categories of costs, but these are the ones that you know we recommend you focus on first. So first of all, know your real costs. And then, you know, when we start talking about optimization and local optimization, as Jay mentioned, um, it's very tempting to buy large orders, right? And Almost always, the reason for that is volume discounts, right? This, this siren song of volume discounts. Your supplier is saying, hey, you know, I'll give you a 5% discount if you order 1,000. I'll give you a 10% discount if you order 10,000, you know, so on and so forth. And that can make your per unit cost look really attractive in a spreadsheet, right? But that's because, again, your spreadsheet probably doesn't take into account all of these hidden costs, you know, the utilities, the insurance, the personnel time involved, so on and so forth, right? So really think twice about those very large orders, even if you're getting a volume discount, okay? And, you know, here's a couple of things uh, that we want to, you know, just sort of leave you with a little sound bites, if you will. You know, again, think about will you still have room to maneuver? And we mean that literally or figuratively, right? It, if you've been in a warehouse where you've just received a very large order because you got a great volume discount, you know what I mean by whether you have room to maneuver or not. You know, similarly, you've got a lot of capital tied up now. You know, can you maneuver? If a new SKU uh, suddenly pops under your radar or one of your existing SKUs uh, demand pops, do you have room to maneuver? Do you have room to uh, respond to that demand? And then the last thing, uh, and Jay alluded to this, uh, you know, really think through and, and talk to your suppliers about whether this is actually what they want, right? A lot of your suppliers will be communicating to you via their pricing structure, hey, we like it when you place really big orders. It might turn out that they really don't like that, even though their pricing structure you know, tells you that. They might far prefer you to order you know, in much smaller batches so long as you guarantee a certain volume over the long haul. Or they might uh, you know, prefer that you order in smaller batches and you know, extend you that discount anyway just because you're a very reliable customer who, for example, pays on time. So really talk to your suppliers, uh, you know, partner with them, really find out what is it that it, that's important to them in their business. You know, find out if you know, their pricing is really communicating something to you that it shouldn't be, and then work with them to, to find a win-win. 
All right. And then next, we want to dive into some of the pros and cons of different supply chain models. And, and one of the questions alluded to this earlier. Um, and just to level set real quick, you know, at a high level, we talk about three different supply chain models. And these are not, you know, all the flavors and whatnot, but these are kind of the, the big ones that we, we want to get on people's radar. The first is local. And, and local is where you've got a supplier, you order from your supplier, you take delivery at your facility, you store, you know, at least some portion of that inventory at your facility on any given day. At any given point, you ship it to Amazon, and then there's some sitting at Amazon, okay? The, the key thing about this model is that you have at least one facility of your own, and you intend to hold inventory there, okay? Uh, the direct model is very simple. It's where, you know, as Jay said, your supplier ships it straight to Amazon for you, and you never touch the inventory. And then cross-stock is, uh, you can almost think of it as a blend of the two. Cross-stock is where you take physical delivery of it, but you don't intend to hold that inventory for any meaningful amount of time. You're really just sort of taking it off of one truck, processing it in some way, whether that's for stickering or kitting or what have you, and then sending it right back out the door to Amazon. And, and the key here is that even though you're taking delivery of the items, you're not planning on storing them for any you know, meaningful amount of time. So that's what we mean by the three models. So we're gonna dive into each one now. So let's start with local. Uh, you know, as with all the models, there are some pros to, to having a local model for your supply chain. Um, you know, first off, it gives you a lot of multi-channel flexibility, right? If you're selling not only on Amazon, but you know, perhaps in a brick and mortar environment, perhaps you know, on a Shopify store, you know, whatever other uh, channel you may be selling on, uh, having that local inventory where you can, you know, uh, distribute those units to your channels as you need uh, on demand can be very powerful. It also gives you at least a potentially lower cost structure than direct um, because, at least in theory, you're not storing 100% of your inventory at Amazon and incurring those storage fees. You know, you're holding some back incurring presumably a lower holding cost on your side and then sort of releasing inventory to Amazon as needed. Um, another advantage, which might not be very obvious to folks, is that having your local facility and having sort of that stop, if you will, in between your supplier and your channels, whatever your channels might be, can help sort of protect competitive advantages and information, right? It, it provides a little bit of opaqueness to your supply chain and, and um, doesn't sort of show all of your cards to everyone else in the market. And then lastly, uh, having your own facility, having physical control over the inventory gives you an opportunity to do some value add, whether that's in the form of customized packaging or bundling, uh, or even just you know, better stickering, so on and so forth. So that being said, there are some cons to the local model. Um, first off, as you know, we talked about earlier, there's the holding costs. You know, you're gonna have to have a physical facility you know, whether that's a million square foot warehouse or your garage or something in between. Uh, and that facility is going to have costs associated with it. Um, you're also presumably uh, going to have to have personnel or at least your own personal time. You know, there's going to be a lot of in-processing. There's going to be organization and reorganization, as we said. Um, and then there's going to be out-processing. And then the other thing, uh, which again might not be uh, terribly obvious at first glance, is that in the local model, you know, by definition, you have multiple shipping events. And whenever you're moving inventory around, that's an opportunity for something to go wrong. Whether it's that inventory got damaged, or it got lost, or it got delayed, or what have you. Um, and so just by the very nature of accepting multiple shipping events, you're sort of incurring extra risk. So in general, this isn't you know, always and everywhere true, but in general, we recommend using the local model for multi-channel kits, um, for multi-channel SKUs that can't be direct shipped for whatever reason, um, and for any SKU where the holding cost is reasonably low, right? Um, uh, and especially if that, you know, holding cost, the low holding cost SKU has, you know, let, let's say higher than average demand variability. Some days you sell 10, some days you sell zero, so on and so forth. Having that inventory buffer at your local facility can help smooth that out. So the next model uh, is the direct model, again, where your supplier is shipping directly to Amazon. And so some of the pros with this model are, you know, first off, you have a single shipping event, not two, not three, not however many. There's a single shipping event, less opportunity for things to go wrong. You don't incur any facility uh, costs on your side, obviously. Uh, you don't incur any time costs. You know, you don't in-process, you don't out-process, so on and so forth. 
and you don't have any personnel costs because, again, you're not doing any of those operations. Um, the downsides, though, are, you know, of course, depending on the SKU and whatnot, you have a potentially higher cost structure with the FBA storage fees. Um, also, you can't pool inventory between multiple channels. So if you're selling, again, a SKU on three or four different channels, you know, one of which is Amazon, um, and you're shipping direct to Amazon, if your demand dries up at Amazon and it spikes somewhere else, uh, it's just that much more difficult to move your supply around and satisfy that demand. And it can just end up in the wrong channel at the wrong time. And you lose, you lose revenue and, and incur higher costs as a result. Um, and then again, one of the cons of this model is that your supply chain is very transparent, uh, both to your suppliers and to your channels. And, you know, in some cases that can be a competitive disadvantage for you. So in general, we recommend this model for, you know, high holding cost SKUs, uh, you know, anything where for whatever reason it's going to be very expensive for you to hold it, you know, th this might be a good option for you. Um, for any SKU where, you know, you're just selling on a single channel because you don't have that, you know, inventory pooling uh, aspect, you know, that can be a good model. And then uh, for SKUs that are commoditized, this can also be a very good model if you have, you know, some other sort of uh, advantage in your business, whether it's uh, the ability to, uh, obtain the inventory at a lower cost or what have you. And of course, all of these assume that your SKU can be direct ship. Oftentimes they can't be. And then the last model again is cross stock. And some of the pros here are that, you know, you do have lower or possibly no facility costs on your side, depending on exactly how much inventory you're moving through your cross stock and that sort of thing. Um, again, presumably you have lower personnel and time costs involved because sure, you're taking delivery, you might be doing a little bit bit of processing, uh, you're doing some out processing, but you're probably not storing things, moving them from one rack to another, reorganizing them every time you get a new shipment, so on and so forth. Um, Crossstock, like local, has the advantage of protecting some competitive information um, in your supply chain. It also, while it, it does introduce multiple shipping events, it gives you an opportunity to do some QA. So, you know, for example, if you have a SKU where you've had quality problems in the past, maybe you were shipping it direct to the channel and, uh, you know, you got a lot of returns saying it was broken, it was the wrong item, what have you. You know, doing something cross stock at least allows you to put eyes on the item before it goes to your channel and make sure that everything is up to spec. And if there is a quality problem, you catch it earlier and can uh, remediate it much earlier. And then lastly, like local, uh, Crossstock also gives you the opportunity to provide some value add. Again, whether that's custom packaging, kitting, you know, special instructions, special special stickers, what have you. Um, the cons of Crossstock, you know, uh, again, can be a little uh, counterintuitive. But the first thing that we point out is, if you're in a Crossstock model, it can get very tricky to juggle multiple incoming shipments if they all arrive too close to one another, right? you might have enough space or enough uh, you know, personnel or, or what have you to handle an inbound shipment from one supplier and flip it and get it back out the door uh, to Amazon. You might not have the wherewithal, whether physical space or personnel or what have you, to handle three or four. And sooner or later, something's going to go wrong. You know, you're going to have your incoming orders you know, scheduled perfectly and one of them's gonna be delayed. And so both of them are gonna arrive on the same day or, or what have you, um, any number of things that can go wrong. So that is a risk you're incurring with crosstock. Um, also, like the direct model, it's more difficult to pool the inventory that you might have uh, between multiple channels. So again, in general, these aren't hard and fast rules, but we generally recommend that you use crosstock for any SKUs that are you know, high holding cost, where you have a single channel, they might be commoditized SKUs, um, or you know, like we said, SKUs that have a higher than average defect rate, because again, it gives you that opportunity to do some QA. Um, or SKUs for which custom packaging or stickering would be good. Um, also, crosstock can be really good for some kinds of kits, uh, but to Jay's point earlier, that, that's probably more of a deep dive than we have time for today. Um, so just you know, have that as a bug in your ear that certain kinds of kits can be very well handled in the crosstock model. All right, and with that, uh, we're gonna recap just very briefly and then see if we have any more questions. So a couple of things we've gone over today um, are, you know, for instance, lead times and knowing your costs. And these are, you know, pretty, pretty basic lean strategies uh, that any good lean practitioner would, would advise you to look into. But the key thing, you know, for this audience is that these lean strategies really help you capitalize on what you care about. You know, for example, rising demand, or they help you avoid discounting or liquidation because of falling demand. 
And that can dramatically increase the agility of your business, both because it frees up capital and frees up space and frees up time. Um, they can also reduce quality issues, you know, whether it's within processing or out processing or so on and so forth. And as we've discussed, that really helps you uh, uh, in your business. And then lastly, like we talked about, it can just dramatically reduce the need uh, for capital or the need for physical space to be tied up and give you that room to maneuver, both literally and figuratively, that we talked about. And, you know, just to recap something we said earlier, you know, when you think about the, the dynamics of the Amazon FBA platform, um, these benefits um, really become magnified even more given how dynamic it is. There are very few other retail environments where you can't think of, you know, some of the, the immense benefits that can be happened from being very agile and lean and being able to respond to very rapidly changing conditions and to ultimately taking advantage of, 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 of opportunities that regularly arise. Yeah, definitely. And, and we agree on, on our end as well. Um, to what you just said, Jay, it, it is really all about doing those small things really well and doing the things that maybe not necessarily every other seller is thinking about, like adopting a lean strategy um, that really do set aside um, those just regular sellers to the sellers that actually really do succeed on Amazon. And one thing that we have been saying uh, for the past few months now really is you need to start thinking of Amazon as its own business to your business. You have to have an actual strategy behind it and have a game plan, like you said, for uh, to really succeed. So really like that point. And, and just in terms of recapping, really liked all the points that we've hit so far. Great. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And so lastly, you know, as we've discussed all these models, um, you know, a lot of this uh, learning and insight that we have is just based on years and years of uh, working with sellers and understanding their pain points, understanding what matters to them in their business. And as Jay mentioned, you know, we don't have time to go into sort of all the nitty gritty details today, but if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you just want to learn more, uh, definitely reach out to us and, and we're always happy to chat and, and see if we can help you with your business. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. And I know we have a decent amount of time for, for questions left. I did have a few questions that have uh, come in just throughout the webinar, not necessarily having a, a great place to just interject here. So wanted to just spend time and answer a few questions. But if you do have any other questions that you want to ask, uh, right now is the time. Use the question box functionality and let us know how we can really address those points for you, any points of pain, anything that, again, you want answered to make sure that you're getting the most of your time. Did want to start us off on something that we have mentioned a few times, which is on smaller, more frequent orders. And, and I guess this is for either you, Jay, or, or Ken. Uh, how do you manage overseas suppliers who push for those full container shipments? Is that more of a communication issue? Is that something that you need to pick the right manufacturers, the right supplier? Is there any tip or insight that you can provide there? Yeah, there, you know, there, there's no one right answer. I mean, a lot of it depends on the sizing of what you're what you're doing. I mean, we do have um, some, some clients, some customers that are very focused on small items <laughs> because they love the, the, the ability to move things rapidly via air into the supply chain. If you've got large items, and the cost of moving things is, is different. Obviously, you've got to move things in in container loads, um, and and it and it's a it's a different ball game. Or you know, if you're doing it at scale, you need to move things in container loads. So, I don't know that there's any right answer. A lot of it depends on on the the you know the weight and size of your SKU, the relationship with your supplier. I mean, these principles apply um, regardless. <laughs> Uh, they apply no matter whether you're sourcing from Asia or whether you're sourcing from, you know, somebody, uh, you know, in, in the town next door or even right next door. They apply. Uh, you just have to apply them in context. So if it's a, a month lead time, you know, obviously, if you had a choice, uh, a one week lead time uh, is better than uh, than one month and one month is, is better than three months. Um, but whatever you can do to squeeze time out of that out of that lead time um really adds to your business agility um and that includes even long lead times i mean if you can go from from three months to 1.5 months by working with your supplier more diligently um, that's a big difference and that really affects the holding cost of your inventory that you have to hold on to at amazon it reduces your risks it reduces your holding costs um, it reduces the amount of money you have to have tied up in inventory yeah and, and one thing i'd add to that I, I i think jay's spot on with everything he just said one thing i'd add is that uh, to Jay's point at the very beginning, it might be the right decision for your business to take the whole container load and take, you know, the volume discount or, or even if there isn't one. Um, it all depends on 
the, the variables involved. You know, uh, what's the cost, you know, the real cost of taking the full container load versus, you know, taking, let's say, one third the amount of inventory and having to pay much higher shipping costs or maybe moderately higher shipping costs. It, it really depends. Um, so, that, you know, to start answering that question for your own business, you know, really sit down and think through the scenarios. You know, scenario one, I take the whole container. It costs me this much. You know, here's how much capital I'm putting at risk, so on and so forth. Uh, scenario two, I pay, you know, whatever, X minus some percent, um, but my unit cost doesn't look as attractive. Okay, wh what does your insurance cost look like? What does the holding cost look like? How sure are you in that demand forecast three months out that you're predicating this on? And then, you know, everybody's risk tolerance is different. You might be uh, comfortable with that risk. You know, somebody else might not be comfortable with that risk. But, you know, just to even make the decision, um, really sit down and, and be brutally honest with yourself about what is the true cost you're incurring uh, getting that large of a shipment. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the answer, guys. Uh, Jay, this next one's for you. I know you mentioned this in your presentation about um, the option that Amazon or the option that you have for Amazon to come pick up the product from your own warehouse. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? So um, I think that the, what they're alluding to there is seller fulfilled prime, um, if I'm not mistaken. So obviously this is a, 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 a mechanism and you have to be approved for it where you can have that prime badge on your product, but it's really stored in your warehouse, not in Amazon's warehouse. Um, and obviously, um, typically when you're doing seller fulfilled prime right now, you're using Amazon's either Amazon partnered carrier or we're now seeing in, in certain environments where Amazon themselves um, are uh, d developing some logistics capabilities. And you, you may find that, you know, some of us in certain areas like us here in, in, in Richmond, Virginia, we're right south of Washington, DC, and we do have Amazon delivery people all the time delivering in our area. Sometimes you may, you may have an Amazon um, logistics capability in, engaged in that as well. Not necessarily, but it could be. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks for answering that. Uh, hopefully that elaborated a little bit more for you, Karosh. Uh, this next one is a little bit more open. Uh, just, I guess it is it, talking about the supply and chain connect option. Um, is it available for other marketplaces on, or marketplaces on Amazon aside from the U.S. right now? Do you know if it's available in Japan, Mexico? Is that not necessarily something that uh, we're familiar with? That's a good question. Um, the best. So the, there's very limited limited information out on it right now, and so I think we're early stage in looking at this. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I've only heard of instances where it's been used in the U.S., um, but I, I I think it probably could be available for for Chinese um, suppliers as well. Um, but I don't. I, I, to be honest, I'm not an absolute expert on that because it is a very new program, and I think. I think as 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 we learn more about this, I think one of the things that sellers will have to think about is you know, is using this program, I mean, it's a good idea, right? You want to connect your supplier to Amazon. I mean, the question is, is that part of your business strategy? Do you, are you comfortable with that, with that level of transparency? Or do you feel like, you know, you'd rather manage your supply chain um, kind of independent of that level of transparency? And that's really a, a business and strategy decision that, that, a, that any company will need to make. Great. Awesome. Hopefully that answered your uh, question there, Mallory. Uh, Ken, this is a question for you. We have a question from Ji Hoon asking if you can expand a little bit more on the cross dock methodology that you had mentioned or the method. Um, I, I know that we have that great infographic on slide 34. I'm not sure if we can go back to that really quickly, uh, but I know that obviously the pros and cons are laid out there. But is there anything, I guess, about this cross dock, cross dock method that maybe we haven't mentioned that might be able to provide a little bit more clarity to them? Sure, sure. So, so yeah, the the cross stock, the, the the analogy there with the with the label uh, is that you know you've kind of got a, a loading dock with uh, you know one door on one side and one door on the other, and you're you know a truck is backing up on one side, you're taking it off that truck, you're walking it over to the other side of the loading dock and putting it on a different truck, um, and you know that that is not quite accurate. That's not quite what what is usually going on. Usually there is some step in the middle where you're um, you know, doing some form of processing, whether that's value add, uh, like bundling or, you know, custom packaging, um, uh, better instructions than the manufacturer or the supplier might send, you know, that sort of thing. Um, 
or it might just be required Amazon prep, you know, labels, stickers, that sort of thing. Um, but the point is, you know, you're taking physical delivery, uh, but you're not intending to store the inventory locally, right? The, you're only taking delivery because maybe you have to, and you really are just going to walk it from one truck to another, or because you want to, to do some sort of processing. Um, but once that processing is done, you know, if you took 100 widgets in one side, you're going to process 100, you're going to send them back out the other side. Um, that's distinct from local where you might take 100 widgets in one side uh, and you might store all 100 and then only process them when you're about to send them to Amazon. Or you might process them on the, the way in, then put them on the shelf and release them to Amazon as you need, you know, whether in batches of 10 or 20 or what have you. But the point is there that you're intending to hold on to the inventory locally for some period of time for some reason, whether it's because you uh, have a lower holding cost structure than the FBA storage fees, or because um, you're pooling between channels, so on and so forth. Cross stock, again, you are not intending to hold any inventory. Uh, you're, you're kind of intending to, to take it all in and send it all right back out. And as I mentioned, there, there are some flavors to that. that. That might not be exactly how everyone uh, listening in on this understands cross stock, but that's kind of what we mean when we say cross stock. Awesome, great. And I think this is actually a great question to end on from Wyatt. Um, and this is just really more so he's asking, is there any really common mistakes or most common mistakes that you see that either lead to longer lead times? I know you mentioned it in the presentation uh, or that might hinder someone to be able to use a more lean supply chain. Again, obviously it depends business to business, but are there any common themes or trends that you see uh, most frequently from businesses that might be selling on Amazon that are doing one or two things that really can, uh, you know, if they just exit out, uh, can can really help them in terms of adopting a leaner methodology. Yeah, so, so the top one. The top one. That's, that's a good that's one. A top question. <laughs> you know, yeah, there are a lot of top ones. You know, yeah. I, I think, you know, sometimes just ordering too much. Sometimes the the eyes are bigger than the stomach, and uh, sometimes it sometimes you need to test and 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 not uh, not hold on to too much. I mean, you know, every dollar that you spend on inventory, that's a that's important. Those dollars mean agility for you because those dollars mean investments that you're making on things that you can trade, if you will, on the Amazon platform. And if you tie up all your investment dollars in, in, in the wrong things and then another great opportunity arises, um, you're, you're stuck. Um, and so that's that's um, I think that's that's a really big one. Um, obviously, all of these all of these. Um, these ideas about watching your lead time are really fundamentally designed to reduce the amount of holding inventory you have to have, the amount of cost you have to have, um, and to be able to flex um, with the changing dynamics of the Amazon environment. Um, so I, I would say that, but Ken, what, what are your thoughts? Is there something else that you, you want to recommend for, for that answer? Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a crack. I might not be able to limit myself to one, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at you know some of the top several. Um, and, and these are in no particular order because, as Jay said, it really does depend. But but somewhere you know up in in contention for a metal would be focusing too much on per unit cost, and thereby ordering too much. Like Jay said, you know I only really need a hundred, but if I order five hundred, I get a ten percent discount. So I'm going to order five hundred. Well, unbeknownst to you, that slows your supplier down, and and in a variety of ways. And so first of all, you're getting more than you wanted, and you're getting them later than you wanted. You know, so so focusing on per unit cost without factoring in all those other things uh, is a big one. And, um, and you may be more bloated than you want to be uh, with that particular right. skew. That's yeah. right. Um, in, in terms of uh, lead, and that that primarily obviously is a uh, is an issue from uh, in terms of lead time from your supplier, whether to you or to Amazon directly. Now, now there always are exceptions to that. I mean, if you if you're making, I mean, everybody that's worked on Amazon, sometimes you've got an end of life product. Mm -hmm let's say, and you know that you're buying the last remaining units of this in captivity anywhere. I'm just, it's a crazy example, but but it happens. And so you know you're happy to sell this thing over the next year because you're the only one that's going to happen. Well, there's an exception. You know, there's always exceptions to the rule. We're trying to show you, you know, common scenarios. Um, there are always sometimes exceptions that you do want those holding costs, but, you know, there's where you're you know, your buyer is making strategic judgments um, to bend the rules because of some, you know, external factors that, that don't always apply. Yeah, and then, yeah um, I think 
Um, after what you both said, and throughout the webinar too, there's a lot of uh, little tidbits of knowledge that I think people can definitely walk away with. I think two of the main points, again, not necessarily just looking to buy in bulk, but really seeing how that fits into your uh, lean Amazon strategy, and, and also taking more into consideration the actual costs and knowing the real costs, as you, you said, Ken, about your actual product and, and operating an Amazon business. I think that that's two great points that, again, not necessarily a lot of people think about when they're thinking about their Amazon strategy. Uh, I guess before we do end here, are there any other last minute thoughts, any closing thoughts from either of you? Um, that's a great question. It is. I, I would say, you know, uh, I would just underline everything we already talked about, you know, really know your costs and, and really make informed decisions. Um, there's not one rule that's going to serve you in every scenario. Um, but if you do your homework, if you are really brutally honest with yourself and look at your costs and follow some basic principles, um, you'll do very well. And, and I would just say that at Ecom Engine, this is certainly a big part of the puzzle, but it's not the only part of the puzzle. We are very, very passionate about helping people be very, very strategic uh, about optimizing their Amazon supply chains. This is part of it. You know, operationalizing things well is another part of it. Being very strategic about financial metrics around your SKUs, around your profitability, about your holding costs, about all those hidden costs that are in your supply chain. These are all things we're very passionate about, and and we, you know, we're just excited that the market on Amazon is doing well, and we we just really enjoy working with with our our customers and clients and helping them be more strategic and grow their their Amazon businesses. Yeah, this is how we geek out. That's about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. And and again, like I said, there just with the summit in general, I really love how the direction of each. Uh, webinar day has kind of fit all together. So starting with obviously just in terms of how to, how to set your goals on Amazon and, and then talking about really the strategy that you should take in terms of your whole Amazon you know business and then on the back end as well in terms of advertising after the fact when you have those products, when you have established that business strategy, really to succeed on sponsored products, really covering a wide variety and I guess the whole scope of the Amazon business and the Amazon ecosystem, I think it's something that uh, was awesome. So again, I wanted to just take this time and, and thank both you, Jay, and you, Ken, for, for speaking. It was a great presentation, but I also wanted to thank the audience members as well for sticking around with us. We know, especially for those that have attended all three days, more power to you. Thank you so much. Again, the time that you spent with us, we do not take for granted, and we are so glad that you have been able to join with us, and we hope that each day has been of value to you. Uh, but as for us, that's all for the Amazon Summit. Looking to close out the Amazon Summit strong. The 2018 Amazon Virtual Summit wanted to, again, thank Ecom Engine, thank Feedvisor, and again, our in-house speakers over at CPC Strategy. As for us, that is it. I'm signing off from sunny San Diego. This is CPC Strategy and Ecom Engine. Have a good rest of your day. Have a great day, everyone.